Oops. I left my bulletin someplace else. Has anybody got a spare bulletin? <laughs> I'll have to grab one real quick here. Here, I thought I was prepared, and guess what? Well, the announcements that are, are listed in the back of the bulletin, where they usually are, and uh, let's see here. Well, the Women's Book Club is, is uh, going to have its uh, January 4th meeting at 2 o'clock. And, of course, the most important one is all the annual reports are due because we do have our annual meeting at the end of the, this next month. It's hard to believe this is the last day of the year. I wanted to say January. It's not January yet. I'm rushing it. Uh, if there are any, uh, uh, for the book club, if there's any questions or anything like that, go ahead and get a hold of uh, Ellie Templeton or Nancy Edgerton to get specific uh, answers and questions answered on that. Uh, next Sunday, January 7th, will be the unhanging of the greens. So we've had all this nice, beautiful surrounding. We've got to pack it away and so we can bring it back next year. Uh, in terms of prayer concerns, uh, I'm a little short on what Mike knows. So what I'm going to do is a little different. We've done it this way in the past. If you have a concern, joy, whatever, that you'd like to bring up for when we're doing the prayers, please just let me know right now. Uh, you've got one. Yeah. So the, the prayer concern is Donna Gibbons, who fell and uh, is in the hospital currently at this point. Uh, are there any other concerns or joys? I mean, this is a joyous time of the season. Ah, she won. Who is that? Mrs. Kim. How oh. Mm-hmm. Okay, for those of you who couldn't hear that, uh, Mrs. Kim passed away on Christmas Day. She was a choir member here, a faithful choir member for many, many years, and she was with her family when she passed. Any others? Oh, Carol Ennis? Oh, yeah, it was Carol, Carol Ennis is, is son, is what? Okay, celebration of life. her son's celebration of life will be January 7th. Uh, I, I'm assuming that we can contact the church uh, after Tuesday, after Monday, starting on Tuesday this next week, to get more details on that if you wish. Are there any others? All right then, let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Fast away the old year passes, and the new year and lasts. In God's providence, we look now to another span of time in which to serve God and God's creation. Let us worship the giver of time and of opportunity.
though the time passes and we hope we can change, we repeat our sins, confounding our Lord and disappointing ourselves. Yet our God relentlessly loves us, offering us forgiveness in return for our repentance. Therefore, we confess our sins with confidence. Lord, we come before you in penitence, asking your pardon yet again. We admit we have acted selfishly, seeking our own interests at the expense of others. We have harbored anger, resentment, and envy. We have wounded relationships. We have pretended to be like you when in fact we have pursued our own interests. Forgive us, we pray, for we cannot on our own truly reflect your truth and glory. To those watching us as Christians, we seek your mercy and give thanks that we have it. In Christ, amen. Friends, we have the assurance of pardon from the word of God. This is the message of the Bible. The gospel good news in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please greet one another. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Good. All right. Well, thank you for coming up and being here on the last Sunday of the, new, of the old year. And uh, we're getting ready to celebrate the new year. Tonight is New Year's Eve. Tomorrow's New Year's Day. So I want to talk about something that's very, very important, and that's New Year's resolutions. I just, let's ask the congregation, how many of you have set a New Year's resolution for 2024? Very good. Okay. So just a little bit of a fact for us all. If there are a hundred of us in here today, and it looks like we're pretty close to that, the bad news is that only nine of you will fulfill your New Year's resolution. In fact, 23% of us will quit on our New Year's resolution after one week 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> and 43% will quit after the first month. So that's a pretty challenging thing. I don't want to discourage anybody, but that's just the way it is. This comes from the Fisher School of Business at the Ohio State University. So, so New Year's resolutions are difficult to keep. But I want to try to talk about a thing that I am trying to do this year, and that's be more patient, to be more patient with myself and with others. And I've got a great example. We have a neighbor who comes over to our property almost every day and sits on a fence post or on a tree branch, and he is the most patient creature I have ever met. And here's a picture of him. This is a red-tailed hawk that lives somewhere but hangs out at our house a lot. And if you look carefully this time of year, you'll see red-tailed hawks a lot because there's not leaves on the trees. So you'll see them sitting on fence posts or fences or telephone lines. So look out for them this time of year. There, there are a lot of them out there. And red-tailed hawks have to catch their food. They can't come to a bird feeder and eat food. So they have to wait very patiently for a very long time for food, which is like a mouse or a vole or a snake, something in the grass. And they wait for movement. And they'll sit there for hours and they'll wait and they'll wait and they'll wait until all of a sudden there's some movement. And here's what they do. See this, guys? They dive down and they catch whatever it is in their claws. So their wait has been worthwhile. So whenever I see a red-tailed hawk, I think to myself, man, I'm glad I don't have to catch my food. That would be hard. And I also need to be more patient. I need to be like the red-tailed hawk. You know, we live in a world where everything happens right away. Everything happens almost instantaneously. If we want to get something to eat, where do we go? The refrigerator, right? If we want to cook something, make it hot, we put it in the, in the, mic the microwave. Exactly, yeah, very good. Right. If we want to listen to Taylor Swift, we just ask Siri or Alexa to play Taylor Swift, right? Yeah. If we want to change the channel on the TV, what do we do? We just push the little button. Well, when I was your age, uh, my parents had a remote control for the uh, television, and his name was Joe. <laughs> Joe, get up and change the channel. We had about four channels. Change the channel. Move, move the button, right? And while you're there, move the antenna, right? Or put some tinfoil on it and stand like this so we can get our reception. So things have changed a lot. Things can happen pretty quickly now. So we're not used to being patient. You know, we just celebrated Jesus' birth. The people of Jesus' time had to wait over 700 years for Jesus to arrive. That's a long time. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a long time. Can you imagine waiting 700 years at a train in Terre Haute? That's a long time to wait, right? <laughs> so we need to learn to be patient like the Israelites did. And we need to appreciate what we have and not always be asking for something that's different or new. Okay? So two things I want you to do when you guys are out with your parents or your grandparents in a car, look up out the window, look away from your phone for a little bit maybe, and, and see if you can see a red-tailed hawk on a branch or on a post. And the other thing we want to try to do is be as patient as we can with ourselves and with each other and with the people that we love. Okay? Let us pray. Dear God, as we prepare to begin a new year with you, please help us to slow down and pay more attention to the beauty around us and to be more patient. Help us to be patient with ourselves and with each other we thank you today for your son, Jesus, for whom we waited so long and who taught us to be glad in our hope and to pray every day. And that's good advice for a new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.
Let us pray. Lord God, teach us by your word, we humbly pray, that we might come to a deeper understanding of your ways. Help us to conform our heads and our hearts to your desires. Lead us in those paths which you have ordained. Use your church to make peace, to lift up truth, and to spread love in your world. In your holy name we pray, amen. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch, the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The second lesson this morning is from Galatians chapter 4. Now the lectionary passage is 4 through 7. But to put this into context of what Paul is really trying to get at, I'm going to add the first three verses. So I'll actually be reading verses 1 through 7. Please listen for the word of God. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we shall, <clears throat> when we were children, will be held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. May the Lord bless these words to our understanding this morning. Well, I'd like to start by saying Merry Christmas again. We've just celebrated the, the joyous part of the Christian year. We celebrated the birthday of Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, son of David. Now, like most of us, I received a few gifts and lots of well wishes. I spent time talking on the phone and using FaceTime with out of town family members. It was a refreshing respite for me from all the issues that I have dealt with this past year. 
They also got me to thinking about what happens after Christmas, or what comes next? Why did Jesus leave heaven and come to earth? He came in the form of a baby. He was born of a woman. And he was in a manger. There is no simple answer to this question, and I am not scholarly enough to say that I know even most of the answer. However, Paul, in the letter to Galatians, did a pretty good job of explaining it for me. Now, Paul usually wrote his letters to a specific church. In this case, however, he wrote to several churches in an area called Galatia, which is now part of the country of Turkey. These churches were arguing over the reason for the law and whether you had to follow it explicitly to become a Christian. The biggest bone of contention came from the Jewish religious establishment who had become Christians, for they insisted that you had to follow all of the law given by Moses and then be circumcised before you could become a Christian. Now the reason that I added the first three verses to the lectionary passage this morning was to help set the context for what Paul was really saying. Even today, we still control or direct our children until they are old enough to be considered an adult. In Paul's time, it was very common in most of the countries to have a ceremony at the proper time to recognize the coming of age or adulthood. Our Jewish brothers and sisters still follow their ancient ceremonies today. They are the bar mitzvah for boys and the bat mitzvah for girls. And the age of the children is 12. This is very similar to our confirmation class graduation that we have here at Central, when children are accepted as adult members of the church. The age of 12 is not a requirement, but it's the most common age that you will see. In our individual families, we tend to wait until our children can understand the consequences of their actions. Examples of this are driving the car, going to vote, or the most important one, what college to go to or not to go to. We protect our children by teaching them things that they can comprehend at the stage of life that they are in. So we're very careful about how we teach them and what we teach them. Obviously, teaching college-level calculus to a first grade math class is not going to work very well. We, as responsible adults, make the necessary decisions for our children at a very young age and then start to give them some autonomy in their personal decision-making small steps. When they are old enough or at the right time, we let them go and pray that what we taught them will sustain them throughout their adult life. Now, some Bible translations actually use the words at the right time instead of in the fullness of time that we saw in verse 4. This really makes a little more sense to us modern Christians when you bring in the first three verses, which is why I added those to the lectionary passage. We already know that Jesus was around at the beginning of time. John 1.1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when the time was right, God sent Jesus to earth, not as a supreme being, but in the form of a baby, born of a woman, and was cared for on his birth night in a lowly manger. Here's the important part. He was born under the law of Moses, so that he could redeem those under the law, so that they could receive adoption. As a side note, some people like to discuss the topic of what is the right time. Why did God send Jesus to earth when he did? 
Without going into a lot of detail, these discussions usually revolve around the relative peace or Pax Romana that the Roman Empire provided during that time frame. The Roman system of roads was well maintained and covered almost the entire empire. Koine Greek became the common language under Alexander the Great, and it was spoken throughout most of the central and eastern portions of the empire as the common language. They didn't speak the Roman language. So communication by letters was very easy. Of course, this begs the question, why did God send Jesus then and not now? We can circumnavigate the entire planet in less time than it took to get from Bethlehem to any of the churches in Galatia. And with the internet, we can send an email to anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. So why did God not send him to us now? Well, so much for rhetorical questions. Something similar to how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? That was a great question that was discussed many centuries ago. Personally, I think God sent Jesus when he did because God's chosen people were finally getting closer to being correct in the way they follow the law. The biggest issue in Jewish history had been the worship of idols. As a nation, by this time, they had stopped worshiping the idols. And although there were still lots of issues with the interpretation of the law given to them by Moses, they were trying to follow it. In other words, they were finally getting ready to receive God's blessing. Of course, not everybody was ready. Some of the people, like the religious leadership, were so locked up in their sin that they could not be redeemed from being under the law and receive what Paul calls the gift of adoption by God. The adoption of God has a special meaning to those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The law shows us what sin is. It is a measuring rod that helps us see where we have failed to live up to the standard that God has set for us. Today, we recognize that following the law is not enough to get us into God's presence in heaven. Why? Because we are not capable of completely fulfilling the law. That is why in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, Jesus says, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. The law is good for teaching children and young or recently confirmed Christians on how to live responsibly in a society no matter what millennia you are in. In fact, today, almost all of our laws can be traced back to the Ten Commandments. For adult Christians, the two greatest commandments show us how to live with the law, not under the law. Take, for example, the rich ruler in Matthew verse 19, chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. My paraphrase of this lengthy passage goes something like this. The rich man, ruler, asked Jesus, how do I get into heaven? And Jesus said to the young man, if you want to have eternal life, then follow the Ten Commandments and additionally the two greatest commandments. The run, young ruler has said, well, yeah, I've done that. But there must be something more. And Jesus' response was to go and sell everything that he had and follow him. Unfortunately, the young ruler couldn't do this because his love for money and possessions was an idol to him. 
So he failed the first of the Ten Commandments and both of the greatest commandments. This is someone who really needed redemption from under the law. Today, as children or young Christians, we are still under the law. We must do our best to follow it. However, when we become adults, we do not need to worry about failing to fulfill it. Jesus has done that for us. In the words of Paul, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we are no longer slaves to sin or children of our parents. Let me repeat that. We are no longer slaves to sin. And then going on in our lectionary passage, Paul says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Or, in some translations, through the gracious act of God. Following Paul's logic in this last verse goes something like this. Since we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are no longer a slave to the law or our parents. We have become brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters of Jesus. If we are related to Jesus, then we are also related to Jesus' Father. And that makes us heirs of God because of his gift to us. The best present we received on Christmas Day was God's gift of his son to us. He gave us the way to be restored into his kingdom. So what happens after all the fun activities of Christmas season are gone? Do we just fall back into our, our normal routines, whatever they are, and wait until next Christmas? Let's ponder this in the light of Paul's letter to the Galatian churches. He is actually admonishing the members of the Galatian churches to not backslide into their old pre-Christian habits. Don't put religious laws and requirements on yourself. Jesus' act on the cross absolved us from our sins because we could not save ourselves. Once confirmed, we have grown up and become adult Christians and are no longer children under the law or the religious establishment. In other words, it is not necessary to be circumcised. Paul, in his illustrative words, is call, telling the Galatian churches that they should not slip back into living under the law or the religious establishment. This thought is the real essence that he was getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, when he wrote, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. So what is next after Christmas? Ultimately, it is our adoption as children of God. Amen.
please join me in the affirmation of faith, which is the Nicene Creed as printed in our bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one God, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, Father in heaven, creator of the universe, with infinite knowledge and understanding, you have brought us all to this place today to worship you. We ask for your guidance as we work diligently to fulfill your will, to follow as best we can the law, but not be overly concerned when we fail, but be humbly asking for repentance. We lift up those members of our church that are, are challenged. Donna Gibbons with her fall. We lift up the family of Mrs. Kim who passed on Christmas Day. We ask that you would keep them in your prayers. We ask that God would put his healing hands upon the families and upon the people who need help. We also come to you, God, with open hearts, recognizing that in our sinfulness, you have already forgiven us so that we might, through the grace of your Son, be acceptable to you. And to that end, we look at the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward and collect today's offering.
God, Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being able to return some of your gifts to us to be used by this particular church in the fulfillment of your will on this earth. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, you your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Our final hymn today, as you'll notice in the, in the bulletin, is really going to be a hymn sing. Uh, so uh, you'll notice there it says uh, uh, between pages 108 and 156, so it's a little easier for you to find your favorite hymn from, from the season. Whatever's your favorite hymn, raise your hand, let us know what it is, and then Steve has decided he will go ahead and play and we'll sing the first two verses. So what is, what is your choice? Hymn number 144. has got a favorite one. Go ahead, Beth. 128. enough time for one more. Who has one more that they'd like to share? Alan. 124. 124.
Son, Jesus Christ, be with us now forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 